Hello, students, and welcome back. Uh, this is the beginning of Unit 2. You should have taken the Unit 1 exam. So this is Module 2.1.1, Introduction to Cells and Some Theories. Um, you can see our first slide here. Uh, and this is, just gives you an introduction and shows you some animal cells on the left, some whole frog skin with some dye on it, and on the right, some plant cells for, uh, from a living plant, very similar to what we'll look at in laboratory. Um, so by way of introduction of cells, um, I guess that we can start by looking at some history. And the fact that cells are primarily microscopic uh, means that our knowledge of them was preceded by an advance in technology, the development of the microscope. And there are a few pioneers that we'll mention here. Uh, Robert Hooke, he was a British uh, physician. He is credited with naming uh, cells. He was viewing some cork under a microscope, cork like in a, uh, a bottle or a cork on a bulletin board, uh, it comes from the bark of a tree. Uh, you can see down here in the photograph in the center what cork kind of looks like. In any case, he's looking at cork under a, a lens system, under a microscope, and it reminded him the repetitive nature of the openings, reminded, reminded him of the repetitive nature of the openings to the monks' cells in monasteries. This particular monastery is in a cave, which is quite unusual. That's kind of cool, that big old rock. Uh, but if you look online at other monasteries, you'll see there is a regularity in the openings, and this is what uh, inspired him to call uh, the little compartments that he saw in the cork uh, cells. And so that's where it came from. The development of the microscope led to a new paradigm. Does everybody know what a paradigm is? paradigm is about 20 cents. Ch -ch -ch, sorry. <laughs> a paradigm is kind of a world view. And the development of the microscope uh, spawned a new uh, paradigm, uh, realizing that there was an entire unseen microscopic world that was among us and even in us. Uh, previous to that, we lived in a WYSIWYG world. If there are any computer scientists, you might know that WYSIWYG uh, stands for what you see is what you get. And so that was WYSIWYG. But no longer was it a WYSIWYG world. Uh, now we knew about the microscopic world. Another worker that helped to develop microscopy was Antoni von Leeuwenhoek. Uh, he experimented with various lens systems. His work was selling fabric. And of course, if you know uh, your housekeeping, Martha Stewart would tell you that the way you can tell good sheets is by thread count. And so uh, Van Leeuwenhoek uh, was introduced to lenses through looking at fabric with them, but he soon branched out into a wide variety of things. And he was very, very curious. He looked at all sorts of uh, materials. He looked at blood. He looked at uh, skin. He looked at uh, sperm. I don't know where he got the sperm, but he looked at it. He even scraped his teeth. And upon scraping his teeth, uh, the following quotation is taken from his reflection upon what he saw. He says, quote, To my great surprise, I found that it contained many very small animalcules, the motions of which were very pleasing to behold. The motion of these little creatures, one among another, may be likened to that of a great number of gnats or flies disporting in the air. So very interesting kind of view. And he, he did combine two words, animal and molecule, to make animalcules. Very interesting. Here is a replica of his early lens system, a piece of brass, has a screw that the specimen was put on, and it would take it closer or further away from the lens. You may or may not know that focus is a distance. Uh, here are some later uh, microscopes that involve, uh, you can see little mirrors to focus, uh, to concentrate the light, and they had a tube and often several lenses. So they got fairly sophisticated uh, approaching modern microscopes in some respects. Um, but this new paradigm was kind of 
frightening to some people who never really considered that. Here is actually something that appeared in a newspaper. Uh, <laughs> notice that the uh, the lady looks horrified. She's looking through a lens and she's seeing all these creatures, almost looks like sea monsters in some cases. Cle clearly a case of uh, journalistic exaggeration. Uh, but sometimes those new paradigms are scary. And what is very interesting is, of course, that the source of the uh, water, the monster soup, commonly called Thames water, which is one of the water sources for the city of London. So very, very interesting times. Um, before microscopes, uh, disease was thought to originate from many different causes, some of them very strange indeed, things such as the evil eye. If you look down at this photograph of a, a mosaic from the Roman city of Antioch, you can see that there is the evil eye or things such as bad vapors in the blood. And the, the belief in bad vapors in the blood led to the practice of bleeding. And bleeding was typically done by the barber by cutting a vein, but sometimes barbers weren't so precise and they would cut arteries leading to uh, severe losses of blood. And so later they used leeches because leeches were very precise and didn't cause this, this problem. Um, there's our evil eye. Here we can see a woodblock uh, in the upper left here of a barber. They put a dish there and then they cut the arm, let them bleed there. Uh, this Theodoric of York down here is Steve Martin, and he appeared on Saturday Night Live as Theodoric of York, and he'd go around and cut people <laughs> on the stage uh, as the barber uh, bleeding them, and it was kind of silly. Uh, this character over here on the right, which might be kind of gross to some of you, but it's kind of fascinating to others of us, is called the medicinal leech. Uh, that is the medical leech. Um, and for centuries, leeches were used uh, as a, a medical aid until we realized that uh, bleeding really wasn't very beneficial. Um, uh, and you may think that this was occurring back in the Middle Ages uh, from this picture here, but our first president, George Washington, on his deathbed, was subjected to this practice of bleeding. So uh, that was a, a while ago, but still not back in the Middle Ages by any stretch. So it was a fairly recent uh, practice as well. Uh, and this leads me to uh, present to you a theory. Now, if you recall our unit on science, theories are hypotheses that have great integrative power that have been supported by numerous observations. And in this whole class, I'm only going to give you a handful of theories, and today I'm going to give you three. The first of which uh, is the germ theory of disease. The germ theory of disease states that some diseases are caused by microbial agents called pathogens. That's it. That's the whole theory. Some diseases are caused by microbes. That's the germ theory of disease. These disease-causing microbes are called germs. And so just this realization right here, the germ theory of disease, has done more to save human life than virtually any other scientific breakthrough. I mean, this made a huge difference in mortality rates and in lifespan uh, as we understood this and we uh, uh, replaced some of our primitive superstitious ideas about what caused disease. Um, and of course, this led to another paradigm shift uh, resulting in sterile techniques of modern medicine. And that was huge. And probably the most beneficial aspect of all this knowledge was the use of soap and water, a simple bar of soap and water. Uh, so your mother was right when she said, wash your hands before you eat, uh, wash your hands before you go to bed. Uh, these are very, very good thoughts. Okay, so uh, one of the things that you should understand is that you, you are perhaps your own worst enemy when it comes to disease because frequently our behavior bypasses our first defense, which is our skin. Our first line of defense is the skin. And through our behavior, we can touch the environment. For example, if you put your hand out on your desk and then you rub your eye or pick your nose, ooh, uh, then you have uh, allowed whatever germs were on the table uh, into your uh, body, past the, the, the skin. So mucous membranes, which line 
your eyes, your nose, your ears, your mouth, your genital and your anal openings, all are subject to self-inoculation. So if you're going to uh, be involved in any behavior where you would touch any of these membranes, you need to first wash your hands with soap to prevent bypassing that first line of defense. Sometimes people put their pencils in their mouth, and I say, well, heck, you may as well just uh, cut out the middleman and directly lick the table where the pen or pencil was. It has the same result in terms of your body. Okay, let's look at uh, theory number two, and that is the cell theory. And this was uh, the result of the compilation of much data from uh, early uh, microscopists uh, making observations and collecting and bringing this data all together. Uh, and the cell theory has three points or three tenets. The first tenet of the cell theory is that all living things are composed of one or more cells. And this was figured out by observation. We look at plants and animals. There were a couple of German biologists, uh, Schwann and Schleiden, who respectively looked at plants and animals, and they came to this conclusion. The second tenet of the cell theory is that cells are the structural and functional units of life, that the cell is the smallest unit of life. We have one cell creatures and no creatures smaller. Uh, so that's an important concept. And the third and final tenet of the cell theory is that cells uh, come from pre-existing cells except for the first one. Uh, and this actually leads to another theory, the theory of biogenesis. Uh, many biologists would simply tell their students that all cells come from pre-existing cells. But if you're uh, any kind of thinker at all, you'll take that back and say, well, where'd the first one come from? And that's what is explained by the theory of biogenesis. So we'll address that theory uh, just now. Uh, but here, of course, our one cell becomes two, two cell becomes four, two cells become four cells, and four becomes eight, and et cetera, et cetera. And so that's all life comes from a lineage of cells. Human life, uh, microbial life, uh, all life is a lineage of cells. And so it's an important thing to, to recognize. And by way of homework, I want you to go home and contemplate your hand. Just look at your hand and think about the fact it is composed of millions of cells. Uh, very interesting to, to consider that. Okay, let's talk about the theory of biogenesis. The theory of biogenesis simply states Life comes from life by uh, a lineage of cells. And the, the historical exception is uh, primary abiogenesis, which is also known as spontaneous or origin. This explains the origin of the first cell. Uh, and it is believed by scientists who use a materialistic explanation. Of course, they must use a materialistic explanation. You can't use a supernatural explanation to explain the origin of the first cell. It simply says that the first cell arose spontaneously uh, through uh, increasingly complex self-replicating chemical systems, finally giving rise to a cell. Uh, so you had a non-living system that gave rise to a living cell. Um, and sometimes people who are somewhat skeptical of this materialistic explanation of the origin of the first cell will say things like, well, if that's the case, why aren't new cells being formed now? And the reason being is because uh, the world is full of life and living things have exploited virtually all niches, including feeding on uh, biological macromolecules. So as proteins would form spontaneously, carbohydrates would form, they would be consumed by life, which is now here. Remember when the first cell formed, there was no such uh, 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 large amount of life on the planet. And so we can see that uh, it is perfectly logical to understand that abiogenesis doesn't occur now, and it may have occurred in the past. Uh, this concludes our first module on cells.